The ancient Greeks wondered on the fundamentals of matter, and this continues to this day. Somewhere along the way, the quest for discovery was surmounted by the effort to prove current theory. People like Daniel Bernoulli and Jean Laurent d'Alembert developed physics and mathematics of vibration and the wave equation long before the dawning of the age of government and foundational megagrants. Before James Clerk Maxwell's effort, electromagnetic theory was incomplete, but through his monumental work, he developed the electromagnetic equations which bear his name through individual effort. André Canton Lorenz, Hermann Minkowski, and Albert Einstein all made seminal contributions to which what would become the special theory of relativity, again through individual as well as collaborative efforts. There are so many such instances, it would take an article, indeed volumes, to list them all. In fact, Einstein's general relativity may have languished long if he had not impressed upon other motivated empirical physicists to put his ideas to the test. Indeed, even now, cold fusion is hindered by the physics establishment, even though radioactive decay occurs every day at room temperature. The well-known methods, including carbon dating, would not even be discussed if it did not. The name Einstein would now remain unknown if peer reviewers had rejected his paper because far too many papers are submitted for publication, or it should be submitted where it can be more rapidly published, or it does not sufficiently expand present knowledge, or countless other nonsensical and subjective reasons. For a theory to be foundational, it must rest on mathematics and clearly obvious initial boundary conditions, as Bernoulli's derivation of the wave equation for string vibrations, for example. Then, as Galileo's observations, they can only be denied subject to resounding ridicule by the facts themselves. Indeed, that the Higgs boson has managed to elude discovery for over 40 long years in the face of billions of dollars and the efforts of thousands is just that, resounding ridicule by reality itself, not from any individuals. The Higgs mechanism is necessary because the weinberg salam equations are a solution of the wave equation in generalized Lie algebras which are massless. The Higgs mechanism is a technique using Q squared theory to add mass. This theory and the direct theory too require that the linear equations are of four vectors in the form of doublets. A Bernoulli or Maxwell would look for a theory deriving a set of linear equations in four vector doublets, satisfying the four vector Klein Gordon equations. Discovery is not fostered by censorship, but by putting ideas to the test. In this regard, that testing is via the empirical crucible. A theory is not foundational if another requires less free parameters and or constants than it does. 
So, investigation in that regard is important. A theory is not totally correct just because it is consistent with current experimental techniques. Classical mechanics was sufficient until atomic phenomena were found inconsistent with it. In this regard, reality was chuckling behind our backs. So unless we are astute as the Bernoullis, we may find our theories the spontaneous generation for our generation. This article demonstrates that a constructive R algebra is sufficient to manifest both the global invariance of charge and mass and answer the question, why do charges only exist where massive existence do? From the R algebra of my book, Reality is a Mathematical Model, the field equations of the electromagnetic nuclear field, which can be expressed in the form shown here, that is the maxwell cassano equations, are a representation of the equations also obtained from the Helmholtzian matrix product form, noted at the beginning of my video, Reference 3. The Standard Model Architecture and Interactions, Part 1. The first book above demonstrates that charge is a global invariant. The second book introduces a definition for a charge function for S sub R matrices, and so for any type of particle. However, the calibration on which it relies is more arbitrary than it really is. The calibration may be more simply expressed via a single parameter relating the units of charge to the first order object fermion. Masses as follows. Charge is a function C with the characteristics here. This neutrino mass estimate used here is near the high end possibility, but this charge function is still well within measurement error range. Now, because Nether's theorem applied to the charge density, see reference 1, insists the above charge function is a global invariant, so is mass energy. Nether's theorem doesn't have to be asserted twice, but Hamilton's principle for charge density is a consequence of the R algebra and Nether's theorem applied to that. With the above insight establishes conservation of charge and through that and the above analysis so is mass energy as a single consequence. It is important that a theory rest on as little as possible. That is why this charge function is preferable to the initial version presented in reference 3. This preference is suggested by the mathematical crucible, but still must stand the test of the empirical crucible. And this illustrates that charge, being a measure of the first order object leapt on masses, only exists where a fermion rest mass exists. The generalized electric field strength mass constituents are basically directly proportional to the charge squared, and also where all or virtually all mass rests. In second order objects and precious little mass and charge in the first order objects. Note that generalized electric field strength mass constituents are zero for the photon, making it chargeless and by either measure given in reference to are massless as well. <laughs>